So yeah, I'm sure many of you already know Dylan or at the very least are familiar with his work, but Dylan is a postdoctoral researcher at the MIT Institute for Foundations of Data Science. And prior to that, he received his PhD from Cornell in 2019. He's done lots of awesome work, mainly focusing on reinforcement learning, contextual bandits and online learning. Um, he's got a lot of best paper awards from Colt, lots of PhD fellowships and is all around an awesome person. So we're delighted to have him here. <laughs> Over to you. Cool. Thanks a lot. Yeah. So today I'm going to be talking about new algorithmic approaches for contextual bandits and reinforcement learning. And this will be based on uh, a recent work with Sasha Rocklin and a follow up to this with Sasha, David Simshi Levy, and Yinzong Shu, all at MIT. So uh, there's kind of a lot to get through here. So I'll just tell you the game plan off the bat. So we're going to introduce a, sort of a new framework for designing contextual banded algorithms, which will lead to efficient algorithms with optimal sort of min max rates. Then we're going to see that this uh, sort of naturally leads into the question of what are the right adaptive or instance dependent rates for contextual bandits. So we'll give some new tools to address this. And then we'll extend some of these developments to reinforcement learning with uh, high dimensional rich observations and functional approximation. So let's go ahead and dive in. Uh, I should say before I really get into things, you know, if you have questions, just let me know. All right. So the contextual bandit is a type of sequential decision-making problem where we learn to interact with an unknown environment. And I'll motivate it using the example of news article recommendation. We're going to play a game for capital T rounds, where in each round, a user is going to arrive at our website with a profile of attributes like age or height. We, the learner, will choose an article to display to them. And then we'll see a response, like whether they viewed the article. And our goal will be to maximize the user response or optimize the user response. Uh, slightly more formally, this profile of attributes, this is what we'll call like a context XT. You can think of this as a feature vector. Uh, the article we display is what we'll call an action A sub T. And the response is what we'll call a reward R sub T. And our goal will be to maximize the total user, user response. Um, I should say before I move on, you know, this sounds like a lot like a reinforcement learning problem with uh, XT, the context being like the state. Uh, the difference is just that in this setting, we're not letting the actions influence how the, the context is evolving. And that's why we call it a context rather than a state. OK. Uh, so, so as this example is sort of suggesting, uh, contextual events have been widely deployed in practice to build recommendation systems. And when we design algorithms for this sort of task, there's a few key challenges that we have to overcome. So the first challenge is that these contexts or these users are arriving in real time, and we need to make decisions on the fly. And the second challenge is that we only see the response for the actions that we select, not for other actions we could have taken. Uh, that's what makes this a bandit problem, and it induces the classic explore exploit trade-off that probably everyone in this reading group is familiar with. But compared to the classical multi-iron bandit problem, there's an additional issue, which is that we need to use these contexts effectively. Uh, let, let me illustrate this issue with an example where we're trying to recommend, say, fruits or vegetables to a particular user. So a given user, like this, this person on the right here, uh, they're going to have a particular reward profile. And if we only care about this user, this is just a multi-iron bandit problem. But if we get another user, they might have a very different reward profile. And in general, other users might have profiles that are somewhere in between. <laughs> in general, uh, we're going to have like a full landscape of rewards where we can think about this as like on one axis, we have actions. And on the other axis, we have contexts or users. And the real challenge here is that in general, these contexts are going to be rich and high dimensional. And we may never see the exact same user twice. So we want to be able to generalize context to avoid solving a separate multi-iron bandit problem for each user. Um, the way we're going to address this issue in this talk is to take what's called like a modeling approach. So we're going to take as a given that we have a class script f of candidate value functions or reward functions, where for a given function little f in this class, f of x a is trying to predict what is the reward of action a if x is the current context. Um, and our first step is going to be to assume 
that this class is actually a good model for the reward function. So what we'll do this is we're going to assume that at each time step, the reward is drawn independently from a fixed conditional distribution given the current context. Um, so we're going to define a function which we call f star, which is the Bayes reward function, which is just the expected value of action A if x is the current context. And we're going to make a realizability assumption, which says that the, the Bayes reward function, the true reward function, belongs to this value function class. So that will be our key assumption. And with that in mind, I can describe the rest of the setting formally. So the way we're going to measure performance here is via regret, which is just the sum of the rewards for the optimal policy pi star that always follows the, the optimal action in expectation minus the reward of the action selected by our learner or our agent. So that, that's our notion of performance. We want to make this small. And I should say that while we're assuming these con rewards are stochastic, we're going to allow the context to be chosen arbitrarily. Right. So with this out of the way, I can say our goal for the talk, which is to develop general purpose methods for contextual bandits. So the idea here is that, in general, in applications, our contexts are usually going to be rich and complex and high dimensional. And what choice of reward functions or value functions works well or does a good job modeling our task, it might be very domain specific. So for some tasks, linear models might work well. For other tasks, neural nets or kernels might work well. And what we want is that we should not have to develop a new algorithm for every possible model we might want to try out. Rather, what we want is an algorithm that can take this model or this reward function class as an input and just make accurate decisions out of the box whenever the model is actually good. And in particular, what we'd like is to have an algorithm which is not much more computationally intensive than doing supervised learning with this function class. Let me say a little bit about the broader goal here. So I like to think about contextual bandits and reinforcement learning as challenging generalizations of statistical learning that add extra interactivity to the picture. So in statistical learning, you know, we have everything is passive. We just get a batch of data, IID. Uh, and contextual bandits adds additional difficulty to this picture because everything is online and the decisions we uh, make influence what type of uh, feedback we see. Uh, and you know, we can, of course, make things even more difficult by allowing our decisions to actually influence how the state or like the observations evolve. And that takes us to the full RL setting. The, the common thread here is that in all these settings, we want to be able to use flexible function approximation to model uh, you know, policies or rewards or dynamics or what have you. Uh, but I would argue that there's quite a large gap between our understanding of statistical learning and these, these more challenging interactive settings like CVs and RL. So in statistical learning, things are pretty well understood in the sense that we have general purpose algorithms that we can apply to any function class and general tools that we can use to understand the sample complexity for, for these different tasks for, diff for different function classes. Um, and what we're kind of trying to do here is close this gap for contextual bandits and reinforcement learning by developing general purpose algorithms. All right, so what I want to say now is a little bit about why this, this problem is challenging uh, and why, at least in my view, it hasn't been solved for contextual bandits to the same extent as supervised learning. So the first issue here, of course, is again, bandit feedback. So if we, if we look at this purple user over here, and you know, let's say we select uh, this pair as our action. We only see this noisy evaluation of the function at this action, like so this blue dot right here. Um, we don't see it elsewhere. We need to balance exploring and exploiting our information. But again, like sorry if I'm repeating myself, we may never see this exact same user again. And so what we really need to do is uh, propagate information across different contexts so that we don't have to solve a separate multi-iron bandit problem each time. Um, and the real challenge here is that when you go for general function classes, like arbitrary function classes, it's really not clear what the right way to like propagate information globally is to solve this explore exploit problem. So you know, if our functions are Lipschitz, maybe we can say that if we've learned the function well at one point, we've learned it well nearby. But if you have something like a neural network, it, it's really not clear how we should uh, you know, select actions at one point, just given what we know about all the other points in the domain.
And we can contrast this with supervised learning where we really have a good understanding of the sample complexity, even for rich expressive function classes like neural nets uh, for general function classes, yeah. All right. OK, now, now what I'll say is one way that you might try to address this problem is by trying to directly generalize what, what works for multi-iron bandits. So for multi-iron bandits, we have this classic upper confidence bound strategy, which goes back to the work of Lai and Robbins in the 80s. And the idea here is, let's say we just care about a fixed person, and we already pulled each arm or tried each uh, treatment a few times. What we can do is estimate the rewards and come up with confidence intervals based on uh, how many times each arm has been pulled. And what we can do is pull the arm that has the largest upper confidence bound. So that would be the apple in this case. And the idea is that this kind of implicitly balances exp exploration and exploitation, because when we do this, we either get a large reward or we are wrong and we shrink the confidence interval. And you can try to generalize this to arbitrary function classes in a pretty natural way, right? So you can try to come up with an upper confidence bound function which bounds the true reward function for all of the, the context x and for all of the actions. But the challenge is, like, we know from statistics that for arbitrary function classes, there's kind of no hope of constructing confidence intervals that are valid everywhere and also are, like, shrinking, even for uh, contexts that we maybe not have not necessarily seen before. Um, there are obviously some exceptions. So, you know, we, we know how to do this for linear models or generalized linear models. And we also know that how to do this in the fully non-parametric regime, where we're happy to sort of uh, like bin yeah. up the domain and solve a multi-iron bandit problem for each point in the domain. But for uh, neural nets, it's really not super clear how to uh, how to how to make confidence intervals work. Was there a question? Uh, can I? Yeah. Can I ask a question related yeah. to this? I mean, like there is this paper by Dan Russo yeah. and uh, Ben Monroy. Yes. They directly are trying to do this. Yes. What do you like? I think that they do have what it confidence. Yeah. So, so the, no. So, 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 so the the challenge is coming up with confidence intervals that are both valid everywhere and also shrink at a reasonable rate. So, so yes, the the Russo and Van Roy that's an important result along these lines, and it comes up with confidence intervals that are valid everywhere. The issue is that uh, you know these don't shrink in general for arbitrary function classes, and so the strategy does not actually like attain the min max rate in general. It does for structured function classes like linear models and generalized linear models. Uh, but in general, it's not optimal. Do, do we know of any examples? Like, do you yes. have any specific designs in this? Uh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't have the I don't have slides on this, but um, I can maybe. Uh, oh, I actually can. I, I can say I can say a little bit about this more later on in the talk because it's very related to um, some of the, it's very related to some considerations that will come up when we talk about adaptive results. But yeah, it's it it's it's trivial to come up. It's pretty trivial to come up with examples where, uh, yeah, like the general function class UCB strategy, it's sort of can just be arbitrarily large compared to the min-max rate. By the way, so there are two the, two two issues uh, at hand here. Yeah. One is whether the confidence intervals are tight or like the confidence bonds are tight. Yeah. And the other is whether based on the confidence bonds alone, the UCB strategy is, is a good strategy or you need some more clever strategy. Yeah. So in your counter example, uh, which of the issues would come up? Right. Like, so, so is it about the tightness or is it about that? The strategy it's, it's really about tightness. So if your confidence intervals are valid, you can always ensure that your regret is bounded by some function of the inner, the confidence intervals or the confidence widths, I should say. Yeah. And the issue is really just that like, if these widths don't shrink, then that's not a very useful guarantee. All right. OK. Yeah, so, so I'll say a little bit more about some prior work with an emphasis on you know, places where we really have a clear idea of what to do. So if we look at uh, certain like specialized models, then we really do have like efficient and optimal algorithms. So linear models, generalized linear models, or like non-parametric classes. Um, but yeah, these are all in some sense using heavily the like geometric structure of the function class to argue that you can get confidence intervals that are converging at a reasonable rate. Uh, and so given the flavor of these results, it seems natural to assume that exploration and exploitation somehow need to intricately depend on the structure of the function class. And the result I'll talk about today, or at least the first result I'll talk about, 
is to show that this is actually not the case. So I'm going to give a way to completely decouple learning and estimation with the function class script f from decision making and exploration. Uh, and the way we'll formalize decoupling these two features, uh, you know, estimation and decision making, is via a notion that we call a regression oracle. So the idea here is that when we design algorithms that are based on reward estimation, a basic primitive that essentially all the algorithms you'll look at will use is regression of some type, be it square loss regression or something similar, like regression with the log loss, logistic regression. I'll stick with square loss for complete for concreteness. Um, so given that our algorithm is probably going to have to use this primitive to estimate the rewards, a natural question is, can we solve contextual bandits only given Oracle access to the function class? And what I mean by this is look, we can have an Oracle, which is just an algorithm that takes as input a data set and returns the function that best fits this data set. And the question is, can we get an algorithm that only accesses the function class through calls of this type? But in this talk, we're actually going to be a little more ambitious. And this is going to be motivated by the fact that we want to get you know, efficient algorithms that can make decisions on the fly. And this is going to be to reduce to online regression. So actually, what we want is if we have an algorithm for regression that can take examples one by one and update its predictions on the fly, that we can get a reduction from contextual bandits to this type of oracle efficiently. And that's going to be our main result. So we have the first efficient and optimal reduction from contextual bandits to online regression with the squared loss. So to describe this for result formally, I first need to be a little bit more precise about what I mean by an online oracle. And this is actually just going to be an algorithm for online learning or regret minimization with the square loss. So the, the Oracle, our squareless Oracle, is going to be an algorithm that just works in the following model, which will be very familiar if, you, uh, if you're into online learning. So this algorithm is going to play for capital T rounds, where in each round, it's going to receive an input instance consider, consisting of a, a, a context and an action that it's trying to predict the reward for. It's going to make a prediction of y hat t for the reward on this, this instance. And then it's going to observe the true reward. And the way we'll measure its performance at this task is in terms of square loss regret. So what is the total gap between the squared prediction error of the algorithm and the prediction error of the best model in our function class in hindsight, given the whole data sequence? So what I want to emphasize here is that this online regression, this is not a bandit problem anymore. It's a full information problem, because we don't actually care about how the reward or how our predictions influence how these, these uh, input instances that we see evolve. And in particular, this is a very well-studied problem. So we have efficient algorithms for this task for you know, the usual function classes you might care about, like linear, linear models, generalized linear models, non-parametrics, and so on. And really, there's whole textbook chapters on this. So we have a pretty tight understanding of what the min-max rates are, actually, for any function class. So with this in mind, let me state the algorithm. So we're going to let y hat t of x a denote the prediction that comes out of our square loss oracle for a given context action pair, given that we've already fed a, a data set consisting of you know, context action reward tuples into it. Okay, And with this in mind, the algorithm for contextual bandits, or our reduction to contextual bandits, I should say, will be as follows. So we call this square CV. So, at each round, this algorithm is first going to get the context xt. And then it's going to look at what are the predicted rewards by our oracle for each action given this context. And we're going to let bt denote the uh, action that has the largest predicted reward, or that our oracle predicts has the largest reward. And once we have this prediction, we're going to assign a probability to each of the actions, which will be this is the probability that we uh, pull this arm. So for all the arms other than the argmax arm BT, we're going to assign a probability which is inversely proportional to the gap between the predicted reward of BT and the predicted reward of the action A under consideration scaled by a learning rate parameter gamma. Right? 
So that, that's how we set all the actions other than BT. For BT, we're just going to assign whatever mass is left over. So, so this whole process gives us a distribution over actions. And now what we're going to do is just sample the action to play from this distribution and then feed the resulting tuple of you know, context, action, reward into our Oracle and proceed to the next round. So that's it. That's the whole algorithm. Uh, let me say a couple notes. So first of all, one thing you might observe immediately is this has essentially the same runtime as the basic epsilon greedy strategy, which is sort of the de facto uh, algorithm in practice for contextual advantage just because it's very efficient. So like up to a constant factor, this really has the same number of flops. So it is actually practical. Uh, and the second point here is that this probability selection strategy, you might be wondering where this comes from. And it's actually a generalization of an algorithm due to a band long from 99. And this is actually a fun historical tidbit. So this a band long 99 paper, this, as far as I can tell, is actually the first paper that has like the modern formulation of the contextual bandit problem, although it predates the actual name contextual bandits by probably 10 years or so. Uh, and what they do in this paper is they, they propose an algorithm for linear contextual bandits that uses this probability scheme. And this algorithm actually gets the optimal rate in high dimension, but it gets a suboptimal rate in low dimension. And consequently, I think it's been a little bit forgotten in favor of the, the more modern, like, hour et al. style UCB type algorithms, which have optimal dependence or optimal rates uh, in, in the sort of low dimensional setting. And so in some sense, our, our, our main insight here is that this actually gives like a general meta algorithm when you combine this with the idea of a regression oracle. Right? So let me move on to the result. So, so our main result is the following. So we show that squares TV ensures that your regret for the contextual bandit setting is bounded by square root of kt, where k is the number of actions and t is the time horizon, times the square loss regret of the oracle. And as I mentioned before, this is with O of k runtime in overhead and runtime and memory requirements. So I'll compare this to previous methods on a few key points. So the first point is that unlike uh, Prior methods that sort of give reductions to regression, we do not require any assumptions on the model class or the data distribution. We so we 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 essentially attain the min max rate. Okay, for any problem, um, this is the first result that gets an optimal reduction to an online or like streaming oracle for regression rather than offline. And we're able to work with this sort of easy to solve oracle, which is square loss regression, rather than a more challenging type of oracle like classification. So I should mention there's a relatively fleshed out and like very interesting line of work which reduces contextual bandits to classification. Uh, the regression oracles tend to be a little bit more practical just because regression is something that we can actually solve you know, in closed form for simple function classes like linear models, and it's generally more amenable to gradient-based methods. Right? So that's the basic result. Uh, what I'll do is sort of try to unpack what this regret bound is and like what this actually means and why it's good by working through some concrete examples because uh, this may be this may look a little abstract at first glance. So let's work with the, Let's look at the concrete example of linear models. So where the reward of a given uh, context x and an action a is just the dot product of a parameter vector theta and a fixed feature map phi of xa, okay, where this feature map is in d dimensions. So one choice we can use for our regression oracle is online least squares. Uh, and this has regret up to log factors proportional to d. And so when we plug this into the reduction, we get contextual bandit regret root kt times d. And so, so this is optimal dependence on t and d for finite actions. Although it is suboptimal in terms of the dependence on k, so you, you can do better on the, in terms of dependence on k uh, when you when you're in this like kind of low dimensional setting, uh, and th this has runtime d squared per step if we do sort of online updates. Uh, but of course, you might want something that's faster on a per step basis, and so you can also use online gradient descent on the square loss as your oracle. So this will have regret root t, and so when you plug this into the reduction, you get contextual bandit regret root k times t to the 3 fourths. I should say here, this is assuming that all the norms of the, the features and the parameters are bounded appropriately. Um, 
This is actually the optimal regret in high dimensions. So if you don't want a bound that depends on D, but you're assuming the, the norms are bounded, then T to the 3 fourths is actually the right rate rather than root T. And the dependence on K in this case is optimal as well. And of course, the runtime here is now linear per step because we just need to do a single gradient update. I'll say one last example. So if we have a finite function class, we can get square loss regret proportional to log size of the function class. And this gives contextual bandit regret root kt times log size of function class, which is the optimal rate for finite function classes. Um, you can keep doing this sort of calculation for all your favorite function classes. The broader theme here is that this algorithm is actually optimal and universal. And what this means is uh, for any function class, it's always possible to choose your square loss oracle such that this reduction can take attains the min-max optimal rate up to uh, dependence on like k, which is not necessarily optimal. But we can also show that the dependence on k in the reduction is unimprovable in the sense that while it can be improved for some function classes, if you want uh, a regret guarantee that just depends on k and t and the regret of your square loss circle, this is the, this is the best you can do. You can't improve the dependence on k. And I'll say to, to prove this, we have to characterize what the minimax rate actually is for general function classes. We do this in terms of the covering numbers, and you can see the paper for details. What I want to do now is say a little bit about why does this work and yeah, how, how do we prove that this works? Okay. So we can think about this algorithm as doing a simple mapping at each step from scores to uh, probability distributions, right? So our oracle produces this vector y hat, which is you know in k dimensions. So we can think about this as living in this hypercube in, in like 0, 1 to the k. And what this Aubian line strategy does is it sort of provides a simple like function which maps 0, 1 to the k onto the simplex. So it, it, doing this, this weighting proportional to the inverse gap between the, the, the different words, so we, we call this inverse gap weighting, the, the, this transforms our score vector into a probability vector. And what we can interpret this mapping as doing is approximately solving what we call a per round minimax problem. So this minimax problem uh, is essentially a problem where we're going to condition on the learning rate used in the algorithm and condition on this vector of scores or predictive rewards from the oracle. And we're going to ask the following. What we're going to ask is, does there exist a probability distribution over actions such that regardless of what the, tr the optimal action for this particular context is, and regardless of what the, the true vector of rewards for this context is, the expected value of the, the, like the expected instantaneous regret under this distribution is bounded by something like gamma times the squared prediction error between y hat and f star. So this is basically saying, find me a distribution such that regardless of what the true reward is, my instantaneous contextual bandit regret is bounded by my instantaneous square loss regret. And so if, if, we, if we look at the value of this problem with parameter gamma, this inverse gap weighting strategy certifies that the value of this game is at most k over 2k over gamma. Um, and it turns out that that's actually not the exactly the optimal solution. And in, in a follow-up work with uh, Claudia Gentile, Maria Murray, and uh, Julian Zimmert, we were able to actually exactly characterize the solution to this min-max problem. And it's actually pretty familiar. As Gary is smiling, right? So this is actually a solution to like a log barrier minimization problem, where you're uh, you're trying to find the the distribution that has highest inner product with the the predicted scores, subject to this log this log penalty. Um, yeah. So, so 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 this actually gets value like k minus one over gamma rather than two k. So that that's not a huge improvement. But what's actually interesting is that this gives an avenue for generalizing to infinite actions. And so we can actually generalize this to continuous actions by replacing this log barrier penalty with like a log debt penalty. And then this starts to look something like kind of like optimal design. 
I'll mention one more generalization. So a couple months after we put this paper online, uh, Simchi Levy and uh, Shu, they, they showed how to extend our result to offline oracles. So, so what they showed is that uh, if data is IID, then for your oracle, you can just use empirical risk minimization. So just take the regression function that best fits the data you've seen so far in terms of square loss. Um, so, so the advantage of this is that A, this just reduces to the basic ERM principle, and B, you can actually get away with only doing ERM very infrequently. So something like log log t times per uh, across, sorry, across like the entire uh, protocol. Um, the downside to this, of course, is like this only works for IID data rather than arbitrary data. And if you do have access to on, on the online Oracle, it will be faster to just use the online Oracle with the algorithm I just presented directly. All right, so I'm going to move on now. So we now have like a pretty good understanding of how do we get efficient algorithms for contextual bandits that work with any function class. And we also understand the min-max rates. But a natural question now is, can we do better? And can we do go beyond the worst case and adapt to nice problems? Uh, uh, Dylan, yeah. there are a couple of questions in the okay. chat. Maybe, maybe uh, let's just go through a few of them. Sure. So Kwan Kwan is asking whether, for example, for generalized linear model, like, do you think that really the square loss is the right uh, loss function to use? Or uh, yeah, sure. could there be something? Um, you definitely can use square loss to generalize linear models when you make this realizability assumption, and we do that in the paper. So if you want to see a proof that that works, yeah. That's no, no, no. I guess maybe the question is whether that's an ideal choice. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Um, yeah, so, so the short answer is actually it doesn't really matter, and y you can kind of use any loss function you want as long as it's strongly convex with respect to the predictions. And, you know, essentially nothing will change. Like the, this algorithm strategy will be the same. So if you want to use like logistic loss or something like that for uh, uh -huh. in your model, you can do that and the strategy will still work. So you're saying that you're going to be getting the right rates in terms of like complexity of the function class, but maybe some terrible constants? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, you'll, you'll get some constant that depends on like, you know, how strongly convex is the, mm -hmm. the, the loss function you're using with respect to the predictions. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, was there another question? Uh, uh, well, yeah. hmm. what? Actually, I was just wondering regarding this result uh, from from Sim Chilevi and Shu yeah. that you cited. So, so how how does their result look like? Because if you're using this offline regression oracle, then what replaces the regret in your bound? Yeah. So, like what the regret is just excess risk for the statistical learning setting. Uh, yeah. Um, right. Okay. Excess risk for like the square the same order. Yeah. 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 Uh, so yeah, it's the same strategy. The analysis is a bit different, and the analysis is actually pretty interesting. So it actually sort of shows that the strategy implicitly solves uh, sort of an optimization problem similar to what arises in these previous like taming the monster style works. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Which is again log barrier. But yeah. 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 Okay. Cool. So yeah. So. Let's imagine now that we want to go beyond the worst case. So what we have is there's actually a fairly natural adaptive extension to the square CV strategy that, that can adapt to nice properties of the reward model. So the adaptive variant is pretty simple to describe. So the idea is we'll follow the same sort of high level approach, but at each time, rather than exploring on all of the actions, we're first going to restrict to a subset of actions that are statistically plausible in the sense that we can't rule them out using confidence bounds. Okay, so we're basically gonna, we're gonna compute confidence bounds and we're gonna say, we're gonna look at actions which are arbitrary, are obviously bad, we'll get rid of those. And then we're going to apply this inverse gap winning strategy only to the actions that survive, all right? Um, and what we can show is that this can adapt to low noise conditions. So. If we look at uh, sort of like a uniform gap in the reward model, like in the sense of Lyon Robbins, meaning like for each context, there's a gap of at least delta between the best action and the second best action. What we'll be able to show is that this adaptive version of the algorithm gets regret that's logarithmic in T and inversely proportional to the gap. 
but proportional to some appropriate notion of complexity for the function class f. Now, I should say what the right notion of complexity is here turns out to be pretty subtle, especially compared to like the statistical learning setting. And to motivate what sort of rate we'll get, I'll take a step back and look at what happens for multi-armed bandits. So in multi-armed bandits, we know that the min-max rate is square root kt. But the optimal asymptotic rate on like a per instance basis, like for any fixed instance, is roughly proportional to the number of arms k over the gap delta, and then with the log t factor. Now, for contextual bandits, let's say I work with like a finite class for simplicity. The min-max rate is root kt times log size of the function class. And you know, maybe a natural guess for what the right adaptive rate is would be k times log size of function class over delta. Right? So, so this, this is the same as the, the multi-armed bandit rate, except that we have this extra complexity term here. But we can actually show that this is not possible. So in general, there, there exists function classes and context distributions such that even when the gap is constant, like even if the gap is, say, 1 fourth, you either need to pay root t or you need to pay a linear in the size of the function class rather than logarithmic, which is, is generally going to be unacceptable. Like we usually imagine the, the function class being very big. And what's going on here is that there's really two sources of hardness, again, for contextual bandits. One is how do we experiment across arms for a given context? The other is how do we allocate effort across different contexts? And so what we need is a complexity measure that you know, maybe we'll be large for this bad instance here, but in general, we'll characterize how, how hard is it to like allocate effort across different contexts and generalize across different contexts. All right, so what we do in this paper is we give a complexity measure that captures this. Well, actually, this is a lie. So the situation is a little bit more complicated, and it involves many factors that influence like the data generating process and how you measure performance. So what we actually try to do is provide a full zoo of complexity measures. Uh, and in particular, we have six different complexity measures. Uh, and all these reflect different settings, like whether we care about having our complexity measure depend on the distribution, whether we care about worst case distributions, or whether we care about adversarial contexts even. And what we can show is that all these are both necessary and sufficient to get logarithmic regress for various notions of the word necessary, which I'll try to be a little bit more precise about going forward. Um, so yeah, if, if you notice that this paper is like quite long, this is because we tried to kind of paint a comprehensive picture of the full landscape of instance-dependent guarantees, both in terms of upper and lower bounds. So we were really pretty completionist about this. Uh, but what's nice is that in the process of doing this, we were able to bridge various complexity measures previously proposed in active learning and contextual bandits and reinforcement learning and sort of link them all together. So in particular, what I'll show here is how to go from the disagreement coefficient, which is a concept from active learning, to the eluder dimension, which is a parameter introduced in like reinforcement learning and contextual bandits. So let me uh, begin by diving into the, the disagreement coefficient on the top left here. So from now on, unless I mentioned otherwise, I'm going to assume that contexts are IID from some distribution. Because, and the, distribution, the disagreement coefficient is a distribution-dependent complexity measure. So we're going to define pi to be the set of greedy argmax policies for our function class script f. And we'll define its restriction pi epsilon to be the set of policies whose probability of disagreeing with the true policy pi star is at most epsilon. All right, so what is the disagreement coefficient? The disagreement coefficient for a fixed parameter epsilon is looking at if we draw a new context from this distribution script D, what is the probability that for this context, there's some policy in this epsilon ball in the restriction here that disagrees with pi star relative to epsilon? And so informally, what this is saying is, how likely are we to encounter a context where an epsilon suboptimal policy disagrees with pi star? And I should say, this, uh, 
this parameter, the disagreement coefficient, this was introduced by Haneke in active learning, and it goes back to like Alexander's work in empirical process theory from the 80s. So empirical process theory, this leads to slightly improved rates of convergence. It plays a very crucial role in active learning where it, can, it is important for attaining exponential improvements over passive learning and sample complexity. Uh, and we can visualize this to make things concrete. So let's say that uh, this black line here is representing our context-based script X and our optimal policy pi star just always plays the zero action. We might have some other policy pi in red that disagrees with pi star right here. We might have another policy which disagrees with pi star here. Um, and what the disagreement coefficient is doing is just uh, collecting like the total measure of all these different places where we have policies that disagree with pi star. So if there's many different locations where you can find policies that disagree, the disagreement coefficient is bad. If they're all localized, the disagreement coefficient is good. And so, so, our, so our first result here is going to be an upper bound on regret that leads to logarithmic regret when the disagreement coefficient is bounded. So let me interpret this. So our regret here will be the max of two terms where we're taking a minimum over a scale parameter epsilon. So the first term is linear in T proportional to epsilon. Uh, and the second term looks kind of like what we wanted. So it looks like a logarithmic regret term, but scaled by the policy disagreement coefficient. And so the interpretation here is that in the worst case, the policy disagreement coefficient is never worse than one over epsilon. And so if you plug this in and optimize for epsilon, you just get the minimax rate back. But if your disagreement coefficient is well behaved, like if it's poly logarithmic in one over epsilon, you can just set epsilon to be one over poly t, and then you'll get poly log t right here. So you'll get logarithmic regret. Um, and I should say this, this, this rate is unimprovable in the following sense. So if you want to have a rate that depends only on the number of actions k, the gap delta, the policy disagreement coefficient, and the size of the function class, then we can show that no algorithm can do better than this exact function up here. So this really is like nailing down what is the right dependence on all of these parameters. But, well, let me also just say, uh, th there, there are a lot of uh, sort of cases that we already know where the, the policy disagreement coefficient can be well behaved from the active learning literature. So like if, if the function class F is linear and the distribution is log concave, or if we have something like depth limited decision trees with a reasonably regular context distribution, these are all cases where you can get polylogarithmic uh, policy disagreement coefficient. But it is possible to get better guarantees. And that will actually lead me to the next parameter we introduce, which is a scale sensitive generalization of this parameter. Like, so what you might have noticed is that like the policy disagreement coefficient is only dependent on the induced policy class and not the class of reward functions. And so our next parameter here is, it's sort of the obvious generalization of this parameter to the, to the scale sensitive setting or to the, uh, to the like value function setting. So all this is, is I have roughly the same quantity, but I've replaced the notion of disagreement by saying, instead of having two policies just not agree on the action, which is like a binary property, now I'm saying that uh, a, a regression function f and f star, these like delta disagree if they're, the error between them is at least delta. And so, so the value function disagreement coefficient is a parameter which is just asking for what is the measure where we can find, what is the measure of all the contexts where we can find some value function f that delta disagrees from f star subject to con the constraint that we're in a epsilon L2 ball relative to F star. Um, and I should say this is for a worst case distribution over actions. So P here is a conditional distribution over actions given context, and we're just taking the soup of this outside. Uh, that, that's actually a little pessimistic. You can do a little better, but I'll, I'll skip on the details for that for now. All right. So the advantage um, here is, yeah. Just a quick clarification question. Yeah. So this measure is on the pair of context and actions? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is the measure just here. Just is... the slide. <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, good, so good. Yeah, the measure here is I draw a context X from script D, and then I draw a, a, an action A from the conditional distribution P. And then you are measuring in this measure, like, uh, like the, the the how big is the set where the disagreement yeah. happens yeah. subject to this constraints. Okay, yeah. good. Um, yeah. And so if you look at it, so in terms of features, the first thing you'll notice is if these functions are actually zero, one value, this just turns back into the policy disagreement coefficient, essentially. Uh, if, if I said delta to like one, that is. Um, but this can be much smaller for structured function classes. So if I have linear functions in D dimensions, this is at most D, exactly. Uh, and if I have like a generalized linear model where the derivatives of the link function are bounded above and below, uh, you know, it's, it's also bounded by D, but proportional to the ratio between these constants. And we contain similar upper and lower bounds. So if this quantity is polylogarithmic, you get logarithmic regret. And we can show that, you know, if you want uh, an algorithm whose rate depends on this parameter, like add a CV is essentially optimal. But the, the, the main thing which we'll sort of like link to the next complexity measures we'll look at is so like the eluder dimension. So many of you may already be familiar with like the eluder dimension. Uh, this quantity is always bounded by the eluder dimension, but it can be much smaller. So for example, if you want to learn a ReLU, uh, you can show this parameter is always poly in D, where D is the dimension, if your uh, context distribution is nice, like say it's log concave or Gaussian. Uh, but there's actually an interesting lower bound. This is like an unpublished work of uh, Jean Lee and Pratish Kamath which shows that the eluder dimension is actually two to the D for ReLU in this setting. So, so the gap can be quite large. Um, and what I'm gonna try to do now is actually show how do you get from here to the eluder dimension. And so the first step in doing this is to go from the distribution dependent setting to the distribution free setting. So the distribution free setting is asking uh, what happens if we care about a worst case distribution, meaning like, we still have a nice reward function that has a gap, but we care about having uh, regret bounded regardless of what the context distribution is. So in the, in the non-scale sensitive setting, like in the discrete setting, uh, Haneke and Yang introduced a parameter called the star number. We call it the policy star number here. And this is a combinatorial parameter that always bounds the disagreement coefficient regardless of what the uh, context distribution is. So, so the policy star number, what this is asking for is, what is the longest sequence of points such that for each point i, there's some policy pi i that disagrees with pi star on this point xi and agrees on all the other points. So basically, for each point, we can find a context that disagrees on this point, agrees everywhere else. So, so Haneke and Yang show this always bounds the policy disagreement coefficient. And consequently, if we plug this into the, the regret guarantee I showed before, add a CV is always going to get logarithmic regret if the policy disagreement coefficient is bounded. And we can show lower bounds in terms of this quantity as well. And these are actually like somewhat strong lower bounds. So we can actually show that for any policy class, uh, your, your algorithm always needs to have uh, regret proportional to the, the policy star number. If you take like the worst case over reward functions that realize this policy class. So Dylan, what, what happened yeah. with the T dependence in this upper bound? Oh, yeah, there's also, oh, oh, uh, it, it's hidden in the, like, tilde. Ah, okay. Yeah, okay. yeah. All right, okay, okay. Yep. Yeah. Um, so, 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 so this gives something for the, the, the like, policy-based setting. Uh, well, we, the next thing we do in this paper is we introduce a kind of scale-sensitive analog of the star number. So we call this the value function star number. And this, this again, is roughly the same except that we're just replacing the notion of disagreement with like delta disagreement between value functions and the, the true value function. Uh, the, the other change here is that rather than asking for a for all context not equal to context i on the right hand side here, we're actually summing over the context not equal i. And this actually turns out to be the right generalization in the scale sensitive case. And people who know about the eluder dimension are already sort of probably seeing the pattern here. Right? So this again corresponds with the, or coincides with the policy star number in the binary value case. Uh, and what we can show is that it always bounds the uh, value function disagreement coefficient. So your value function disagreement coefficient, regardless of what the distribution is, it's always bounded by this parameter squared. 
And I should say, removing this square is like a very interesting open problem. And uh, I can talk to people more about that offline. Again, we have upper and lower bounds based on this quantity. But now what we can do is go from here to the lunar dimension. So the idea here is if we now move from stochastic context to adversarial context, everything is the same. All the changes is that rather than having like sum over j not equal to i, we switch this with a sum of j less than i to sort of incorporate the fact that contexts are chosen in a dependent fashion. Right? So the eluder dimension of Rousseau and Van Roy, exactly the same the definition as last slide. I just have a j less than or equal to i here. And so consequently, it's, it's immediate to this upper bounds, the value function star number. And what, what do we know? So first of all, you can show that the UCD strategy gets, again, logarithmic regret, but proportional to the value function, the leader dimension, when this thing is bounded. And this is related to the point Chavo was asking at the very beginning of the talk. So bounded in lunar dimension really means that regardless of what context you see, your confidence intervals eventually shrink. Um, and the interesting thing that we can show is that, uh, again, for any function class, not just for worst fate place function class, there exists a family of instances such that your regret needs to be lower bounded by the eluder dimension over gap. The caveat here is that this is a weak version of the eluder dimension that has some additional technical constraints, and I can tell people more about that offline. But the point here is that while the eluder dimension actually is not the right parameter if you just care about minimax rates, at least in the finite action setting, it is the right parameter if you care about instance dependent rates and that material context. OK, so just to summarize, we started with the disagreement coefficient. We moved from here to the uh, distribution free setting and ended up with these new star numbers. And then we showed that these are bounded by these eluder dimension parameters in the adversarial setting. And I should say, all these are necessary and sufficient under different conditions, and the gaps between them can all be arbitrarily large. All right. So we're just about out of time. So I'll, I'll just say a little bit about how do you kind of extend these developments to RL. All right. So, so the short answer is what we can do is we can use these to control the rates at which uh, confidence intervals shrink when we do sort of RL with function approximation. So, so our result here is for the like block MDP setting. And so this, this is an episodic RL setting where we have like a, a layered episodic MDP. So within an episode, which has length h, we're at each round going to you know, pick an action, observe a reward, and observe the next state drawn from some distribution. Uh, but, but what makes this an interesting setting is that you know, these, these contexts or these states, these might be very high dimensional, but what we'll assume is that there's some latent state space S and that it's possible to uniquely map the observations down to the latent state space so the dynamics factorize. So at each time, actually, given a particular state and action, we're going to draw the next latent state from this distribution and then draw the context from a fixed emission distribution for the latent states. And the key assumption here is that these emission distributions have non-overlapping support. That's the this is to factorize. And so, of course, if we knew the latent state space or we knew the mapping for the latent state space, we could just do like planning an RL here. We don't, so we're using function approximation. So we're going to take, uh, as a given that we have some value function class that can, and the analog of our realizability assumption will be this optimistic completeness assumption. So basically, if we take any value function and do its bell and backup, this needs to be contained in the value function class. So this implies like a notion of realizability in the sense that Q star is contained in the value function class. Of course, it's quite a bit stronger. All right. And so the main result in like two lines is the following. So we can get like a fast instance dependent rate for RL in block MDPs whenever we have a gap in the true value function Q star. So whenever the gap between the best and second best action Q star is delta. And whenever an appropriate analog of this, the value function disagreement coefficient is bounded. So when we're in contextual bandit land, the value function disagreement with coefficient was something that depended on the context distribution, which we took as a given. In RL land, 
we're going to have one disagreement coefficient for each emission distribution. Like so, for each latent state, th this latent state has an emission distribution over observations or observed states, and you can define the scale sensitive or the value function disagreement coefficient for this. And we're just going to take the max of this. And what we can show is that you get regret, or not regret, but you can find an epsilon suboptimal policy with the number of episodes proportional to 1 over epsilon and proportional to 1 over the gap. So this is beating like the worst case rate, which would be 1 over epsilon squared. And this is oracle efficient. So you can reduce this to regression as well. Um, I'll say just two words about the algorithm. So this is a variant of optimistic LSVI. The only uh, tweak we're doing, which is interesting, is we have uh, an extra step which sort of lightly convexifies the set that we compute upper confidence bounds on at each step. So usually when you compute upper confidence bounds, you say, let's look at, on, uh, like, say, like a beta sized L2 ball around like the square loss minimizer and then compute the upper confidence bound over the square loss ball. Here, we form the star hull of this set and then compute the upper confidence bound over the star hull. So, like, if F is a discrete class where each of these points is a function, the star hull convexifies the class along like rays emanating from a fixed function. This sort of stabilizes these predictions. That's what allows us to get. Uh, sample complexity bounds that depend on these disagreement parameters. All right. I will wrap up now. So let me just summarize by saying we have this hierarchy of data decision making problems, all of which are generalizations of statistical learning that add additional interactivity. So, online learning adds sequential decisions to the picture, contextual bandits adds partial feedback, RL adds evolving states. Of course, there are many problems between these different settings and beyond. Um, I mostly talked about contextual bandits in this talk, and we were able to provide both a general purpose algorithmic principle and general tools for understanding the sample complexity in the worst case and in the instance dependent setting. And the hope here is we can kind of continue this development and explore the statistical learning based perspective in RL and more broadly all decision making. And hopefully this will lead to you know, new, interesting, and practical algorithms. All right. So thanks a lot. Um, let's uh, open it up for questions. Yeah. Oh, wonderful. Thank you, Dylan. This is really great. Nice. Cool. So yeah, everybody, please post your questions in the chat. Uh, so I got, I, I got like a bunch of questions. The, the, the first of these is, of I course, I have the uh, chat now as well. So, huh? oh, so I just pulled up the chat so I can look as well. Oh, yeah, right. One, yeah. Well, I guess there's, there's not that many open questions in there. And okay, cool. Anyway, we're going to curate those. But the, so like my question, like I guess my first question is really regarding this connection between the log barrier and, uh, and the action distribution that, uh, that you're outputting. Yeah. So like while, so, so why I was laughing when, uh, when you mentioned that first was yeah. that this is the way that I was always thinking of this algorithm, you know, the first time I saw your paper, I was like, okay, well, they do log barrier, right? Yeah. So, uh, but your proof does not go through this, or at least your original one does not go through this. Yeah, it doesn't. Yeah, it doesn't really use any of the usual like properties that you would use to analyze like mirrors and or something like that with the log barrier. Okay, and and, and do you think that that like other choices of the regulation could work there as well, or is it really um, necessary to use this log barrier? Yeah, I think they can definitely hurt. I mean, like the obvious one, right? Is um, you know, if I just switch to like relative entropy, right? Then I mean, this really just becomes Boltzmann exploration in this case. And like you know, I mean, yeah, like you know, you have this nice paper which shows that you know this mm. doesn't really work for exploration as is, even just for multi iron bandits. So yeah, like the. The, the the regularizer itself is playing a pretty important role here. I mean, the the, the fact that it's log barrier specifically. Hmm. Okay. But the, I was thinking that maybe you could use like uh, entropy regularization in a different way because I'm sure that uh, you're familiar with the uh, with the cold paper of uh, me and Yulia from this year as well. Oh yeah. Where we were like essentially using well like a variant of this idea independently of yours, right? So that was like doing exponential weights over actions, but that was like the adversarial case where you're doing like uh, importance weighting estimators, yeah. but eventually it, it had like a very similar flavor. I'm just wondering. Wait, you need the exponential weights though, right? So like. 
Yeah, so that was, that was exponential ways. That was using the log barrier regularization. Oh, no, sorry, like entropy regularization. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's like the thing is like when you don't do importance weighting and this sort of thing, um, it's much less clear to me how to sort of use more general uh, regularizers like beyond the log barrier. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like, um, yeah, like. I, it seems like the log barrier has like special additional properties that mm -hmm. you know help it to attain these guarantees, and I, I I don't think that like something like exponential weights will give similar guarantees for this setting. I mean, yeah. you know, it, like yeah, yeah, right. Okay, so may, may, maybe that's like a very technical question. Maybe we can get back. To this interesting later. question. I mean, yeah. But, yeah, like yeah. Uh, you know, like also, also like the mini monster or like whatever it's called. Yeah, like yeah, yeah. Of the you know, I, I think like yeah. all of these things seem connected. I think currently like the links between them, we don't have like a very concrete way of doing this. And uh, yeah, it would be very cool to come up with like a more general framework. Mm -hmm. right. And yeah. yeah, and I think in some sense, the hope of doing this is that this would give like a more systematic way of. You know, extending these techniques to new settings as we encounter them, like you know, different types of action spaces and this sort of thing. Right. So, and uh, I guess my other question related to this is that did you think about using this strategy for for the reinforcement learning setting as well? Because there you just ended up using UCB, but maybe yeah. So, so, so it's tricky. I mean, technique. for um, yeah. So, so there definitely are ways that you can use this with the RL setting. So one where we actually do know how to use this is if you do like MDPs with side information, like contextual MDPs. So for that, we actually have work kind of in preparation that uses this for that setting. Um, for the block MDPs, I'm not sure because somehow like the the using like the UCB is it's much more important for RL because it like you know. It, it, it drives exploration in this very strong way, and it allows you to get these like decompositions of your regret based on confidence and bounds. You know, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. like I, I don't think just the strategy on its own solves RL. Like what we're doing with contextual MDPs is an algorithm that like mixes this with UCB, and that that seems very promising. And I mean, I think you probably can extend it to RL more broadly, and this is definitely something I'm thinking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, All right, that's great. Yeah, yeah. I have a couple more questions, but I guess like others. Also. Yeah, this is a few other questions in chat. Uh, I guess, so Chi Cheng was asking, have you thought about extending this to guarantees under different assumptions with context-dependent reward gaps? Yes, this is easy. So I mean, like you can extend this to Sivakov and so forth as well. You really just change like a couple lines in the brief. Um, should I just go through these in order? Uh, yeah, I guess. Well, may maybe you can, you can, these people can speak up and ask their questions. So yeah. how about you go with Jeffrey? Hi. Um, so my question was whether that kind of one algorithm or framework, the square CB at the beginning, uh, gives you these like optimal or nearly optimal rates for all of the different six settings that you've described or six kind of yeah. parametrizations of hard without needing to tune it. So you can kind of yeah, take yeah. one one hammer for all the different nails sort of thing. Sure. Um, yeah, so so the adaptive variant of it we have, which is this one that we were calling square uh, ADA CB. So 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 that does do this without prior knowledge for the basically for all the complexity measures that we had in the stochastic case. So so for the disagreement coefficients and the star numbers. Um, so all the guarantees in terms of the star numbers are just just arise because the star numbers immediately upper bound the disagreement coefficients. Um, and so, so I guess what I'll say is, uh, so, so add a CV will adapt between like the worst case and the instance dependent rate, but it the, the tuning is different for the uh, policy disagreement coefficient and the value function disagreement coefficient. Uh, that said, I do think it should not be that hard to extend it to get both simultaneously. Thank you. But yeah, I was going to say, like, you, you, you do need to tweak it a little bit if you want something for the adversarial setting, and that we have not done yet. OK. When it comes to the instance of rates, rate, that is. Um, yeah, so, uh, so um, oh, go ahead. Yeah, so, so Mayank had this question about uh, 
or else oh, that picture that's gets that's in Q that's stars. That's so like, what is it? Phi that shows up in there? Yeah, so, so, so Phi, the, the setting here is, um, yeah, at each time we draw the latent state from this distribution P, and then Psi is like the emission distribution for the, the state. So it's, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, yeah, but I guess like when you define this uh, theta well on yeah. the next slide, I suppose, then like what is the relevance of this max or s? That's something that I didn't entirely grasp. Right. So, okay, for a fixed s, this is just saying, so, okay, fixed s, and we have a fixed emission distribution. So, this is just, we're basically now in the IID setting, right? We're just drawing context from this fixed emission distribution. Okay. I mean, so, I, I, like, does that make sense just to start? Like, well, I, I guess I'm really just wondering, like, why is that max there? I mean, do you think that can be replaced by an expectation or some conditional distribution? Oh, good question. Or... I mean, so, so what actually arises naturally in the analysis is like a sum over these things. But I mean, the sum and the max are, you know, poly. In, they're, they're the same up to a factor of h, and this bound is loose in h, so it doesn't really matter. Now, the more interesting thing is, can you get this in expectation under some? nice distribution and I don't know yet. Like hmm. yeah. Like one you could right. ask is can you get this like yeah, can you get something like the value function disagreement coefficient when the distribution is like the marginal distribution under the optimal policy? That seems like a little too good to be true. Although it'd be interesting if you could get that for sure. Um I I, I I'm guessing you can't. I, I think it should be probably not too hard to show that. But um yeah, is there something a little bit nicer? I'm not sure. It's a good question. Oh, but, um, with respect to the, uh, if we look at from a um, um, base uh, perspective, if we have a um, model-based approach and uh, those um, latent embeddings are already uh, kind of like uh, present there, then we can have that kind of a um, sampling and uh, those kernel functions can, can work here, right? I'm not sure I understand. Ah, uh, okay. Um, we can talk uh, yeah. offline. Yeah. Yes, yeah. All right. So, uh, so Sharon had a question. Can you oh, ask yeah. a question? Sharon? Can you relax realizability and get reasonable bounds using this machine or something breaks? Yes, you can, and it's in the paper. It's very easy, actually. Yeah. So basically, if you're like epsilon misspecified, then basically the regret gets worse by a factor of epsilon times root k times t, and this is in some sense like the best you could hope for. Um, I should also say in the in this follow up with uh, with Claudio and Mariar and uh, Julian, we're also able to show how to adapt to the unknown misspecification if you don't know this in advance. So, like, if you want to use the basic strategy I described, you do need to tune the learning rate based on the amount of misspecification. But it is actually possible to adapt to this, so you don't need to. So you mentioned that uh, there is an extension to infinite number of actions or large action yeah. cases. In all of these bonds, K shows up. What replaces K in, in these other uh, bonds? So or so do you need me, micro? Yeah, so let me first say, I don't know how to do this for the instance dependent rates. Uh, so this is really something we've only explored for the worst case rates so far. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the, the, the setting here is basically, it's sort of like a semi-parametric setting where you have so arbitrary functional dependence on the context, but the dependence on the actions is linear. And what I mean is we're going to still have some class of functions f of x, and the mm -hmm. reward will be something like, so f of x will now map to r to the d, and the reward will be something like the dot product between the action, which is an r to the d, and f of x, okay, or f star of x. So it's almost like it's linear bandits by the context modulates the parameter. Exactly. From, in, in a way that you uh, don't necessarily know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and then and so basically what happens in this setting is k is replaced by d, the dimension. Yeah. And yeah, so in particular, if you go to like infinite action linear CVs, you get the usual t root t rate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. OK. Um, Blair is asking, bounds all appear to be in terms of log f. Does this directly get replaced by empirical covering number? Yes, it does. Uh, yeah, we just wanted to keep the paper to like a modest 100 pages.
Um, okay, there's a question here about is there a posterior sampling version of square CV? So I'm not exactly sure what a posterior sampling version of this algorithm would mean, but I want to actually like maybe say briefly like or emphasize why this is different than posterior sampling, right? So posterior sampling at each time, you know, we actually have a full posterior over like reward functions, and then we're going to do something like sample or reward function from this distribution and the optimal action for this. The, the interesting thing here is that we're not doing that, right? Like we don't have a posterior, we just uh, have a point estimate, and we just do a little bit of post-processing on top. And so the fact that this actually works, even though it's, you know, at the face of doing something much less smart than posterior sampling, I think it's kind of amazing, actually. Yeah, I was gonna, I was gonna say that as well because apparently, like, the way that this algorithm somehow exploits the structure of the function class, it feels like very, very implicit. It it all yeah. goes into this regression oracle, and it and it. It's not very insightful, you know. I'm just trying to think. Yeah, yeah how does yeah, it yeah. really try to explore the space? How does it really actively do any exploration? And you're commenting that, well, maybe this is not the right approach for RL because it doesn't really do this over there. But like, can you offer like you know any insight on this? Um, or is it just as mysterious to you as? Uh, no, no, no. I, I, I think actually the the analysis that like Yunzong has for the stochastic setting is very illuminating here. And so what that one shows is really that you can interpret this as solving a optimization problem similar to the taming the monster optimization problem. Meaning like if you ask like find me a distribution over policies that uh, you know A is guaranteed to have low regret given my like reward estimator so far, and B is guaranteed to have low variance if I importance weight. Um this, 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 this action distribution actually like implicitly solves that, that problem, but where you ask for this, these sort of constraints solve for all policies rather than just for policies in a fixed class, which is what happens in the Taming the Monster paper. So it is implicitly solving like a, a, an optimization problem that really says like balance making my expected reward large and make my variance under importance weighting, which is sort of you know, a proxy for exploration make this small as well. Yeah, right. But this is like still like a little bit of a weird explanation because yeah. the algorithm does not use importance weighting, right? And importance yeah. weighting, like you know, God knows if that's no, the no. Right so, 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 so it doesn't use importance weighting. But even when you don't use importance weighting, um, the sort of things that appear in the analysis of importance weighting are still actually very relevant. Like, um, and the reason for this is because. These are really just densities, like inverse densities. And so they allow you to control density ratios when you want to ask, like, how do I, you know, given, given that I've, you know, explored using this distribution so far, how useful will the data I've collected be for, you know, future contexts or future actions that I haven't already seen? Hmm. Um, yeah. Like, I, I, I don't know if you, you if you've seen like the regressor elimination paper, right? Th this is the sort of analog of the Taming the Monster stuff that is not Oracle efficient, but uses like the same sort of optimization problem in the realizable setting. So in that one, you also don't use importance weighting, but still these like one over probabilities appear everywhere because you need to do like density ratio shift arguments. Right, right. Yeah. But then since uh, these importance weights at least show up in the analysis implicitly, like, do you think there's any hope that this would work in some kind of an adversarial setting as well? Say, oh, like, fixed context, context distribution and adversarial rewards? Uh, no, I would be pretty surprised. Like, I would say almost all the power from this is coming from the fact that you're realizable or, like, near realizable. Oh, but, uh, I mean... I'm thinking of an adversary setting where things are still realizable, right? It's really just oh, that yeah, the yeah, yeah, looks yeah, like yeah, a different factor totally, from the yeah, other. Totally fine. Then it's totally fine. Yeah, that works. Uh, really? OK, so like, uh, so let, let's go over this one, one more time. Yeah, so, yeah sure. So, so just to be clear. I, I, I meant to think of a setting in which adversary chooses a function from the class, right? Yeah. You play an action, you get a reward, and then you just move on to the next. Stage. Do you think that the same algorithm works there as so? well? Oh, I guess the question is. I guess are, are, 
So get you, is that you're sort of like thinking about the setting in the 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 this like adversarial paper you you guys had earlier this year. That's yeah, like, yeah, something like that. Yeah. That one I don't. I'm not sure because in that one, like somehow the the like reward like the Bayes reward function, like even though it's linear, is like changing from round to round, right? Mm -hmm. Or that's I mean, even ignoring issues of like efficiency and so forth. I don't really know how to solve that setting for general function classes. Oh yeah, so right, right. It's actually kind of hard to say for me to say anything super smart about that one right now. Yeah. So. I guess my bet would be that the same algorithm that you guys have now, it's it's not gonna work there. Yeah, I would be surprised. It's something surprised. totally non trivial yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, when you when you're in this kind of like one shot setting where the, the base is like it's it seems important to be able to do like importance weighting and so forth in that setting. Yeah, yeah. But but like importance yeah. weighting is also least squares, right? Yeah, I mean it's yeah. different. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you just have like a single observation, and then you le do least squares on that, while yeah. you know like the context distribution. Or at least this is how I like to think about it in the, in the linear setting. Okay, but I guess like a, a... It's, it's, it's a good question to keep thinking about. <laughs> okay, so then I guess like a a twist on this question is that uh, like given the connection between the log barrier, this algorithm. And the mini monster. Yeah. Uh, so I guess like one question is whether the mini monster has uh, guarantees for the adversarial case. Do you think that uh, such a thing can be shown? Oh, um, probably not as is because it's still reducing to ERM, right? So like even for this strategy, when you use ERM as the oracle, like. Th that only works for stochastic context. That doesn't work for adversarial context. So, um, right. But yeah. yeah. So, so, so when I say when I say uh, when I say mini monster, I mean like you know this crazy implementation that's somewhere in the appendix that uses the log variant, right? So it's just yeah. right thing for the FTRL essentially. Right. Um, when it becomes essentially the same algorithm as what you have in this paper. Well. Sure, uh, but st still, that one is like, I no, I, I I don't think the basic like regret constraint in that one, which is basically just looking at regret under the rewards you lose so far with importance weighting. I, I don't think that's the right constraint if the contexts are actually adversarial. Like I some somehow like oh, I, the context should not be adversarial. Yeah, yeah. I, oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. No, no, no. yeah. Um, like if the context are adversarial, somehow you really want to be doing like online learning over like the policy class. And mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, I mean one one interesting question is like, I mean, which is still unresolved, right? Is like you know how to do when you when you're in like even just like the agnostic stochastic case, how do you reduce to like online oracles, right? Like mm -hmm. you know how to do this? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. That's right. 